Normally when we have a five speaker lineup, there's not much time for the floor for open discussion. But in fact, today, uh, I thank the speakers for being concise uh, because we have plenty of time for, for discussion. We will make sure to end by 11.30 because I know normally that some of our participants would have lunch appointments and so on. So we have the next uh, 50 minutes or so. Uh, floor is open. I, I would recognize first the, the stakeholders. I know we have some perhaps uh, 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 kind participants, and uh, you know, I would I would give you some some min some time to talk if you would like to. Floor is open. Uh, I I'm not familiar with the uh, Myanmar situation, so I have a one uh, very basic question, uh, Miss Gwen. Uh, why Rohingya people is so uh, so detested or disliked by uh, Buddhism in Myanmar? I think that. Uh, uh, many ASEAN countries are um, multi-religious and multi-ethnic, so there are a lot of uh, different religious groups and uh, different ethnic people. In Myanmar as well, uh, they are talking about peace process with other, uh, different ethnic uh, minority groups. So uh, Rohingya people are so much disdained or disliked by Buddhist people because uh, they are uh, Muslims or just they are different ethnic groups or just they are they I'm sure that before the independence, uh, Rohingya people was there. So, but uh, for Buddhist people, Rohingya people as a kind of invaders, or they they get rid of the uh, the part of the territory of the uh, Myanmar, something like that. So I don't understand why. So there's a so antagonism among the Buddhists. An excellent question, and there's short answer, and there's an extremely long answer. So I think I'll go for the short answer, and also point out there's a few experts in this room including Chris Lewell over there who I don't know if you want to say anything Chris or Kun Kassid you've um, talked a lot about the historical origins I think as you say there's this list of 135 officially recognized ethnic groups in Myanmar they're not um, the Bengali Rohingya whatever you call them are uh, not on that list and they're not uh, considered an ethnic group they were excluded from last year's census which was the first census in uh, Myanmar for decades and decades um, why the animosity on uh, just various aspects that become so complex but uh, part of it is you're right many have been there for generations um, this was uh, tackled and raised actually by the Myanmar government in its Rakhine Commission report which was a pseudo which was a, a long inquiry held over 2012, 2013, came up with a variety of initiatives, including proposal to look into citizenship or rather right to citizenship and defined that if a person, including Rohingya, which the word they don't use, they use Bengali, could prove that they'd been there for so many generations. However, many of these people do not have documentation. There's no documents to speak of, particularly the 140,000 who've lost their homes and lost everything they have, have nothing to prove where they're from. On the other hand, the concerns are very real and legitimate, as we've heard at least, you know, some anywhere between 20% to 60% of these people on boats are actually from uh, Bangladesh, maybe Kun Kassid is right, we don't know for sure um, you know, who, they, who they really are, whether they're in fact genuine Rohingya Bengali from camps along the border inside Bangladesh. But the point is there's a genuine animosity that is almost a brainwashing inside Myanmar when you realise you move around perfectly rational, um, even a lot of friends of mine will 
you know, be extremely compassionate, caring people and talk about human rights, democracy, campaign for political prisoners. But when it comes to this issue, they just, like, you know, seem to have a mental block. And I think a lot of people are, are brought up like that to believe that these are interlopers who never belonged, um, have come in to steal jobs, marry the locals, um, replicate, um, spread their religion, spread their beliefs. Also in Rakhine State, issues that don't really help is that there's a particularly fundamentalist or, a, or conservative form of Islam that is practiced by many of um, these people, particularly up north. Uh, you can see um, women are not allowed to go to school. Um, many women will sit there having babies for their entire lives. So families of eight to 18 children are not unusual. The population demographic, what information we have, has grown over the last, uh, um, well, probably more than, much more than 80 years to, um, you know, start at a very small proportion of the population of Rakhine State to a full third. And that uh, makes the Buddhist Rakhine extremely nervous. When people are nervous and fearful, they react very you know, as we've seen around the world in situations, they react, you know, very viciously at times. So, you know, this is fueling it. And actually, it has to be said, underneath there's a there's an animosity that stems from British colonial era and um, the wide migration in from neighbouring India and Bangladesh, um, which was not called Bangladesh back then, under the British uh, colonials, to bring in Indians and uh, Bangladeshis, uh, what, what we know now as Rohingya or Bengalis, who worked extremely hard, um, they built up their savings, lent money, um, got very good jobs in the administrations. The colonial bureaucracies were vastly resented by uh, the locals. And in times of crisis, for example, the big uh, rice commodities collapse under the British colonial period. They foreclosed on, on properties, recalled loans, caused a lot more hardship. The first thing that happened in 1962 in Nguyen's coup, when it all blew up and the military took over, was that the Indians, Chinese, and with the Indians, the Rohingya Bengalis, these were all people seen as interlopers who were making money off Myanmar. It played to the real xenophobic core of that one strikes in Myanmar and they were expelled but many have come in and actually it is true that you know a good proportion of some of the people particularly in cities making vendors are coming in from across the border and uh, the identity issues are huge and let's just say it's not just Rohingya per se as I said I went to Make Tiller in night, uh, 2013 a central town near Napidor which are you know, there's a lot of Muslims there who are just Muslim, Muslim Myanmar people. They're not uh, Rohingya. Um, and uh, they were absolutely in the front line for, um, for um, uh, persecution. And uh, still today, mosques in Myanmar are often targets of attack and these extremist Buddhist groups. Um, so I'd say that there's, it's just a combination of factors and there's no single factor, and there's nothing, I think, that these people can do to actually convince or win over um, the Burma majority, who seem to really just have this mental block about it. Sorry if that's not very helpful. In, in the 1960s, many of my uh, Myanmar friends who are Indians and Chinese origins were being kicked out from Myanmar at that time high school friends. And I think uh, the question with the Chinese and to a much more the, um, the bigger extent the, uh, the Indians in Myanmar, I think is the perception from the Buddhist Burmese of the remnants of the colonial legacy that they were the agents of the British colonial administration. So that hatred is ingrained inside and is being instigated, and then uh, it makes it legal to to extricate, to separate the the, the, the Rohingyas. 
so now the question is that colonialism is, is a passe. We are talking about ASEAN Charter, UN Universal Human Rights, and so on. So it comes back to the political parties in Myanmar and the political will of the leadership to re-educate the people and to make uh, Myanmar really a tolerant uh, society and accept the Rohingyas as they are as part of the, the Myanmar societies. It's the political will is important. Thank you. You know, they disagree about many things in Myanmar. Like in Thailand, they disagree about a lot of things. But one thing, this is one thing they don't disagree about, that the deep dislike bordering on the hatred. And part of it is a combination, socialization, indoctrination. But I, I think also a little bit of the superiority complex that was subjugated uh, during the colonial era uh, that is now kind of re-emerging. Uh, so we, we can we have to discuss this further outside and beyond, uh, Mr. Izawa. Let me move to uh, the consul from the Bangladesh Embassy. Uh, just uh, give you the initial uh, story about uh, you know the illegal uh, migration or the victims of human trafficking uh, in the Andaman Sea. And uh, basically, uh, this uh, phenomena is very recent in our context, and it started probably in 2013. First, uh, in uh, uh, May 2013, we got a note from Thai Foreign Office. Uh, it says that you know there are around 1,200 uh, illegal migrants entered in Thailand, and among uh, these 1,200, some claim to be uh, Bangladeshi nationals. They gave us a list of 55, and we interviewed all of the 55, and found 38 of them are uh, uh, from Bangladesh, are Bangladeshi citizens. And with the help of Ireland Thailand, we repatriated all of them in 2013. And in 2014, in March, uh, again, we, we received another note from Thai Foreign Office. It says that 1,800 uh, uh, illegal uh, migrant entered into Thailand by boat, and among them, uh, 214 are from Bangladesh. And we interviewed all, all of the 214 and found 212 are genuinely from Bangladesh, two are not from Bangladesh, and we repatriated all of the 214. Uh, my uh, point of uh, giving this uh, statistics is that uh, initially probably the, the mix of the people from Bangladesh was very low, but somewhat uh, day by day it increased. And uh, our initial estimate is that, you know, around 25 to 30 percent uh, of the boatload of people are from Bangladesh. And, uh, and uh, of course, uh, uh, there is a perception that, you know, that the Bangladeshi people are leaving Bangladesh due to uh, the poverty or, 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 or uh, due to economic cause. Uh, but our uh, government uh, differs with this per perception uh, on the grounds that, you know, the Bangladesh has achieved over 6.2 percent GDP growth over the last decade. So there is no point of uh, leaving Bangladesh for economic ground. And personally, uh, we have interviewed around uh, 1,300 uh, reportedly Bangladeshi nationals uh, detained in Thailand. And I personally interviewed over 700. And what I have found among the 700, 80 percent of them are from some six, six districts of Bangladesh. We have 64 districts. And these six uh, districts, uh, you know, are economically uh, very vibrant districts compared to other districts in our north, which is relatively poor, and the people of that districts are dependent on agriculture. But the six districts, we have industrialization in these six districts, and two of the six districts are bordering India. Uh, that is, we have land ports in these two districts. So, uh, in our uh, understanding, these uh, six districts are not, uh, you know, uh, poor as per the economic activities. Uh, so, uh, uh, we don't think that the, the, you know, poverty is the reason for their uh, going out of Bangladesh. What we understand, we have uh, very strong uh, transnational uh, criminal networks operating uh, in this region, and they have very strong foothold in Bangladesh. And our law enforcement agency have already killed six in encounter, and we have arrested 300 uh, human traffickers so far. And uh, we, you know we have a very strong law uh, about uh, the trafficking. We have uh, in, uh, anti trafficking uh, trafficking deterrence law, and it has the capital punishment provision. 
and we have also overseas employment act it says that if anybody uh, leaves uh, bangladesh uh, for job overseas without any documents i mean without any uh, valid work permit or work visa they have to uh, serve a sentence for three years and if the persons involved in sending these persons without any valid documents so they will have to serve for eight years so we understand that we have some implementation challenges so our government is setting up seven special tribunals to to try uh, these uh, human traffickers so hopefully uh, you know uh, we'll be able to you know uh, deter human trafficking originating in bangladesh but we understand that this is, is a regional problem and there are some external factors also and we are uh, very much uh, uh, like to engage with uh, some other ASEAN countries who are involved in this process uh, to stop this menace at once and for all. Thank you very much. Yeah, my name is Mong Jono. I belong to the Burmese Rohingya Association in Thailand known as BRT. I'm also former political prisoner of conscience from Myanmar in Burma. Sorry, I don't like to say the Myanmar. Uh, thank you very much. Give me the mic. I'm very sorry because I cannot get the time because there's many uh, the presentation. I appreciate that all the you know our colleagues and some friends. I agree most of this, but not all. So for example, His Excellency, uh, former Foreign Minister, to say something about the history. Maybe I have some point. I disagree. Maybe not correct. Uh, some mostly correct because this due to you know the. Uh, lack of, you know, the which you call the finding or something like that. Also, the uh, the lady, uh, Miss Kaby, I think, uh, I don't know what her name, I, uh, Kaby, yeah, and uh, you are talking about some British uh, time settler before the British times or something like that, but drawing us a note about that and also, uh, you also mentioned that uh, uh, during the Navy era, 1962, uh, he came into the power through the back door, I mean General Navy. Since then, of course, they, he also deported many uh, foreigners. Uh, they say foreigners, but they are not foreigners all. But none of the Rohingya were, was deported during the Navy era. This is very interesting. None of the Rohingya was deported during the Navy era. And still I'm saying that none of the Bengali is still exists in the Rohingya, in the Arkan state. Uh, so if uh, I invite you all of you, you know, if you have the chance, you know, please go and uh, you know visit my country and see that. And this Rohingya are not British time settler. Of course, we have some British, British time satellite. This is in the proper Rangoon or Mandalay, proper Burma, not Arkan. You can still see some. But Arkan is not a very livable state after the independence. Arkan was known as Mughal Muluk lawlessness country uh, by the Bangladeshis. Bangladeshis are, of course, the poor, but they do, no, none of Bengali like to come to the, our country. As well as our relationship between the Bengali and the Rohingyas, I don't know why, the Bangladeshi people, they don't like any Rohingyas. They don't like to give shelter, even a glass of water to the Rohingyas. Of course, I think to the government, of course, they, by, uh, the, through the humanitarian ground, they gave, gave, and still they give the shelter to the Rohingyas. But during 2012, uh, around uh, 10,000 Rohingyas, uh, you know, used the boat and uh, reached to the Bangladesh. They, all these Rohingyas pushed back in the 2012, uh, in the June. It means they don't have any sympathy towards the Rohingyas. Uh, we, are, we don't have any connection with the Bengali. So the, my question to you is, uh, thank you to the, you know, the, the, the political uh, science faculty to hold in this forum and draw in the attention of the terrible uh, suffering of uh, our people the Rohingya of Burma. This is not issue of the trafficking only, but the Rohingyas are not trafficked from the Arkan. The trafficking is happening inside the Thailand, some uh, some area in the Malaysia. Do, uh, you know, not in Arkan. They are only, uh, and, uh, and the Rohingya are singled out uh, for persecution. Rohingya, um, Rohingya very, I mean, the, you know, Rohingya only managed to turn to come out from uh, Arkan uh, through the brokers, you know, uh, by boat. Because this is the only way to escape crime against humanity and ethnic cleansing or genocide as reported by human rights uh, groups. But the Bangkok meeting on Friday, 29, May. I also was there, I mean, not in the meeting, in the press briefing, and uh, without invited guests. I, I, I'm not invited all, uh, everywhere, you know, because we are unwanted, sometimes unwanted, unwanted in the, in the, here also. 
and uh, the final statement completely, uh, completely avoided even using the words Rohingya and refugee. I'm in 29 uh, so-called, you know, 20, uh, uh, 17th country meeting. So I condemn and you know for that, and I'm very sorry about that. Even though that's supposed to be what they are talking about, uh, about, I would like to ask the panel speakers if they, honourable uh, academics and the humanitarians, and the, I mean the. Uh, uh, the you know the uh, uh, diplomats. Are you the deliberately avoid using the certain words as Rohingya refugee in order to escape, to escape a peace or give face to the Burmese uh, Thailand government so you can have access there? I mean in Burma. So, so How I'm we can? Sorry, I'm going to interrupt you. Just just one second. Um, so your point is that um, this, this, the Rohingyas are refugees, is that right? Yes, please, to, please make a couple of points and ask a question or two. Uh, yes, okay, then how we can solve, or how you can solve, or ASEAN people can solve uh, uh, this problem, Rohingya problem, even you are not saying they, uh, what we are, what we are, that's, uh, this is my special question to you. To even Thank you very much. Even recognize me. Rohingyas, right? That's what your point is, to recognize. I'm not recognize, sorry. We, we are the bona fide, we are the bona fide citizen of Myanmar. We don't need even, we are not asking the citizenship. We are only asking to return our taken rights, uh, taken rights, it means our taken uh, document, it means the citizenship. The Burmese government, successive government, they took our document, I mean our citizenship right. Please return our this thing. Please give the pressure to the Burmese government or uh, talk to the Burmese government in this regard. When we have the, yeah, that is my, this is my question. Yep. Uh, okay, thank you, thank you. Look, what yep. do the Rohingyas want? Oh, yeah, uh, we, wa not, we, we want uh, to get back our right, to get back our right from Myanmar. It means we used to have the right, everything in Myanmar as well as like Kachin Shan Mon. The successive military government took away all our rights. We need to get back our rights and the problem will be solved. And I'm very, we are opposing to get the resettlement of the country because this is the policy of Tenzing. Tenzing used to talk with the High Commission for the Refugees, you know, in 2013, that please take all these refugee Rohingyas to the third country and resettle there. So they would like to drive off all the Rohingyas. So the Malaysia and Indonesia, you know, they're giving shelter for one year and telling, encouraging the, you know, the foreign, I mean, the, 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 the rich country to resettle. I oppose it. Resettlement is not the solution. We like to go back to our own country. We like to leave our own country. And uh, please keep the pressure. Uh, please list the, you know, please list or please book this Burmese, the, the, the criminal as, uh, you know, crimes against humanity. Thank you very much. Uh, one uh, reading reports about the Rohingya, uh, it strikes me that the solution that most people offer is to give them citizenship. Um, I want, my question is simply, would that make a difference? Um, because states in transition from some form of authoritarianism to democracy, the very process of democratization creates a situation in which the politics of identity become manifestly powerful from politicians, which is why the lady has been silent, I think, uh, leading up to the election in Myanmar. Um, and if you were to give the, um, this indigenous group, uh, ethnic group, their citizenship rights, would it actually make any difference to the political process uh, in Myanmar? Because politicians will be politicians, and the tragedy of the international political system is that politics takes place at the domestic level, not the international or regional level. Um, and uh, unfortunately, it seems that politicians look to the next general election and not the next generation. Uh, you know, a politician will be there when he or she wants you, uh, needs you, wants your vote. Um, so given the political domestic structure of what's happening in Myanmar now, in, in, in the process of transition, uh, would given citizenship to the um, Rohingya make a difference? When would you, would you address that a little bit? Would, would uh, giving back, well, giving citizenship rights, uh, and this is a point that the minister also made, uh, would this, what would it do? 
Maybe um, also, Jeff, uh, you might like to say something about this. Um, looking at, uh, I mean, I'm I'm on slightly uh, less known turf when I say this, but I think um, it, we've got to see this in the context of the extraordinary movements we're seeing around the world and what's happening in Europe. I mean, you think this is bad? I mean, the the boatloads that are drowning every day in, and being brutalised in, uh, in Africa, going across to Europe, and the and the sheer uh, volume of boat people that uh, Europe is contending with at the moment. So these issues of citizenship are, um, are just uh, so multi-dimensional and I think uh, in a way for the reasons that I mentioned before, the, the, um, the dysfunctional view and role of, uh, of Rohingya or Bengali in Myanmar uh, is an added factor on top of that. But um, this notion that just because you're there for a while is the citizenship is automatic has to really be, I think, um, much more uh, d widely discussed and agreed uh, internationally. Um, this, I mean, it is natural and it's, it's understandable that uh, governments need proof that you've been there for a while. Um, you haven't just walked across a border. Um, and you look at the, the Rohingya are one of, what is it, 17 stateless people in, 17 I think there are, or nearly 20 stateless groups around the world. So um, this citizenship issue is not unique. Uh, I just think the Myanmar context is unique. Um, and uh, having been brought up in this Rakhine Commission report and now with a slight breakthrough with the um, Bangkok meeting and at least willingness on Myanmar's part to talk about it, um, there is some hope and, you know, this is a door that uh, the regional countries should press on in subsequent follow-up meetings. But as I said, it won't be this year that we see any, um, any progress. Would you have a comment on? I think partially there was so much attention here because there was so much attention in Europe at the moment. And that's not the only maritime movement. There's the Sea of Adan and there's, and there's uh, in, the Medi uh, in, in uh, Latin America and the Caribbean islands the Haitians who go on boats. There's a lot of different phenomena, but it's exploding in Europe. It's a massive phenomenon. I think something like 130,000 plus people have landed so far this year, and there's been thousands of deaths at sea. And so the, the attention was already on this issue when this one came about. And there's certainly similarities. There's similarities of people being at sea and deaths at sea. Here, I think the phenomena is interesting because there's probably as many deaths on land as there are at sea. Um, but there's extreme vulnerabilities and smuggling and, and issues of trafficking. And so there's those parallels. I think there's also big differences between the two. And, and I think it's interesting to note those and how we deal with those issues. What's happening, and I've been to Libya each of the last three years doing some different work and it visited the detention centers there and was very interested in the boat phenomena and checked it out myself also because of what was going on in this region but there are there are people from this part of the world who were in libya and there's people from africa and a whole bunch of regions because the salaries were very high and migrants fueled uh, the workforce in oil rich economy where they're able to make money and fund trips fund trips off to Europe. I don't see that phenomena here, to be honest with you. I don't see Northern Rakhine State or um, Cox's Bazaar being a pull factor from people from all over the world to get on boats to come over to Malaysia. It's almost funny when you think about it in that context. Um, what I think we also see is that with the arrest, the killing of six traffickers um, and 300 other individuals, and also the stopping, uh, essentially, of uh, the routes through Thailand. Many of the boats were Thai, and they've been stopped. That um, we don't have the same phenomena as, at all as the Mediterranean, and that we don't have people keep jumping on boats. There's been no departures since April, zero. Now, we're in the, now if, even if they wanted to get on smaller boats, they'd have a really hard time landing anyway. And so it's essentially stopped. And so it's hard to understand why we couldn't deal with a boat phenomena itself in a much different way than we did with the Mediterranean. In a way, we made a big uh, comparison of masses of people who are invading our country when it was a very limited amount of people who are still at sea, we believe, by the way. We still think there's a couple thousand at sea um, who were uh, a marginal percentage of the overall phenomena and very easily could have landed and been able to look at that 
um, issue. And I think because of the size, to, to address an earlier question, that that's why there's not been the invocation of the CPA, the Comprehensive Plan of Action. Because if you have a few thousand people who are landing, why would you want to set the precedent that will only take them if you guarantee to get rid of them out? There's 50 million refugees today in the world. We have a few thousand in this current context. The CPA was a very specific action several decades ago, which was so important for the hundreds of thousands, the hundreds of thousands and streams of people coming out. This is very minute. It's very, very small. And so there are similarities, similarities to the Mediterranean, but also big differences, I would contend. Um, but I think there's some bigger issues which we're addressing here with the panelists, which make it no less complex. So the fundamental difference is that here, is it more the case of a market driven, being market driven and being a thriving, unregulated industry, as opposed to in the Mediterranean, where it's a more social phenomenon out of desperation and destitution? Uh. I think that's a hard question to answer. I think that the difference is is that the governments who are working on this issue can limit the, the operation, and it's not going to be going on forever where right now in Libya, we don't see an end to what's going on, and that's making it much more complicated. I'm Commander Bunche Tongshu from Royal Thai Navy. And uh, I like, on behalf of the Royal Thai Navy, I'd like to thank to Julian Lungkorn University uh, to host this uh, conference and, and tagging on this problem. Uh, the, the Royal Thai Navy have been facing this problem for a long time, and many governments before that. And uh, uh, we, w we were, uh, issue that uh, we should keep this uh, subject matter down uh, instead of brought it up and saw in the right right uh, pattern. Anyway, uh, as a Thai government, I we have the duty and responsibility to solving the problem, particularly the security uh, to Thai people and to Thai uh, nation. Uh, and that that security matter is is big issue for us and to everybody, every country, wherever you are from. And I think this is um, the matter of uh, national and, and the global. Anyway, uh, in, in Thai Navy, as I work in the Navy for almost 20 years, we have been tackling this problem, as I mentioned. The regulation is important for any country to regulate their own security. And everybody here have to follow the law in your country and in this country. So do I, so do as the Rohingya people. They have to follow the country uh, law and regulation of the international. And that, that, that the only thing that, you know, people can live in the world in the same symphony and, and the peaceful world. We tagging the problem, uh, I don't think it's the right spot. I think you're tagging the problem at the, the, the carrier country, at the, the final sort. You, you're not tagging at the, the original sort. The problem will originate in some place, original sort, carrier sort, and the final country that they're going to. I don't want to get into that area, but we have to recognize that these people, they are moving from one place to another place by breaking the law, law of their own country, law of the carrier country, and the law of the final country. And that, that's very important. And that is not only Thai Navy can solve that problem. That is the regional problem. And that's why the meeting on 29 is starting point and the great point that we get many countries to involve, particularly the original sort. Another thing that I, I think we should share here is we got many good NGO around here. We got many good international organizations who work with this group of people, who understand these people, who can get to the sort and who can provide them with the right information on how they can do the right thing, how they can do, follow the law of individual country that they will go through. And 
importantly, how they can make the correct or the legal immigration to the final country. You can arrange that, you know, migration. You can provide them with the information, the right information. Any smuggler that provide them, any illegal activity that providing them, you can providing us that information, and we will taking them down, you know, as our duty. And that I think that the, that the correct path of solving this problem. And I, I think, thanks to the the Thai government right now, that you know, brave enough to to tackle the problem in in creative way uh, not only the the problem with the tip uh, or the problem with the the eu but also making this as the the country and the regional problem and and making sure that this problem uh solved in the right way and making sure that these people in the same pattern of the migrant I, I i didn't say that we have to make this migrant correct but we should make this migrant on the right and follow the law. That, that's my comment. And I'd like to address the comment that uh, Mr. Sherman made about the political dimension of this problem in Myanmar. Um, there is a Rakhine political dimension because, as I understand correctly, in 2010 the USDP handed out white cards in Rakhine. Is that correct, Chris? In 2010 the USDP made it easy for people to get white cards in Rakhine State. So therefore, a lot of Rohingya got white cards. Um, <clears throat> this um, offended the Rakhine National Party, which is one of the rabid Rakhine Buddhist organisations, um, because it threatened their political hold in the state, uh, and their concerns were justified, because the USD, USDP did win quite a few seats in the 2010 election in Rakhine State, which would have which would have hardened the attitude of the Rakhine Buddhists. Um, there is a bigger political dimension because um, earlier this year, because of the pressure from these hardline Buddhists, especially monks who <coughs> disgrace Buddhism, um, the government has withdrawn, the, the government has asked people to hand in their, their white cards. Um, people could use white cards to vote in 2010 and 2012. The fact that um, the non-Indigenous uh, minorities have been disenfranchised, the um, uh, Muslims, Christians and probably Hindus in some cases, means there's, there's going to be fewer um, non-Indigenous voices in the Parliament and therefore my concern would be that the attitudes of the hardline Buddhists are going to become more prevalent and I think this is this is a very serious problem and I don't think um, Myanmar is going to change its mind on this. I don't think the Myanmar are going to back down on recognising the Rohingya at all. I think what is happening at the moment is exactly what many people in Myanmar want and that is that for the Rohingya to get out because they don't re recognise them as being Myanmar citizens even though many have lived there for generations.